Good afternoon. I'm going to speak about hospitals as a challenging and vulnerable area in case of an intervention. Of course, in the context of a terrorist attack, but not only. Luckily, we didn't have any terrorist attack against a hospital, but we had a serious fire in a hospital, and we had some other issues which could show us that hospitals are vulnerable and are very challenging. They are not like living uh, like apartment buildings or office buildings and so on where you can sound the alarm, there is a fire, everybody runs down. Hospitals have patients which are bedridden, they have patients which are ventilated, they have patients which cannot move, and they may be much more exposed. Plus, here you can see a car. It's inside somewhere. It's inside the emergency department, in fact, of one of the busiest emergency departments in the country. It happened just a few, about two or three months ago. And it was not a terrorist attack. It could have been. Imagine this person going into the emer emergency department with his car and having it loaded with something to explode inside. It happened. It happened during the night. It was mere luck that we didn't have any injured or killed person. This is a very busy department, and he went exactly into the triage area. Why he did it? He got angry with the security guard. He broke the barrier, which is a simple barrier, and he drove his car directly into the emergency department. And this is not the first incident we had with the car driving into the emergency department. We had another incident with, again, with a group of people which were angry and they drove their car in another city into the emergency department. And the emergency departments are really soft targets. They are open. They are open for everyone. Anyone can go in. You, you cannot sit and control them. You cannot sit and, and do it. At least we don't do it until now. Maybe we should be doing at least a minimal in, uh, verification of those who are coming into the department. Just anyone can go in and anyone can do anything they want. We had another incident a few years ago. In a city where there is a chemical factory, a chemical plant for fertilizers, two persons were heavily exposed to ammoniac. That factory had its own private ambulance inside. They put the two patients with their clothes and everything inside the ambulance, and they ran with them to the emergency department, and they just pushed them inside. And we had to evacuate the whole emergency department because nobody could breathe anymore inside. So these are signs that should show us that these areas are very vulnerable, and we need to start thinking of this. In 2010, I was still at the Ministry of Health. I was Secretary of State at that time there. And I got a call in the afternoon on a summer day. There is a fire in what we call the Julesht maternity, one of the very well-known maternities in the city. And when I got that call, it was clear it was something serious. I went into the car, went on scene, met the chief fire officer of Bucharest there. And the fire was inside the intensive care unit where we had the premature children, 1,500 grams, 2,000 grams, some of them intubated, ventilated on equipment. And what happened was is that there was only one nurse allocated to that department. It was during the crisis, the economical crisis. We were not allowed to hire. Hospitals were requested to hire one for every seven people that leave. That was something which was imposed in a way, in an indirect way, by the IMF on the hospitals and on the health sector. And the Ministry of Finance accepted that. But in fact, we made our hospitals much more vulnerable. One nurse to an intensive care with 13 or 11 ventilated and critical babies is very, very little. That nurse left the intensive care unit for some reason. And this is when the fire took place in the intensive care unit. No fire alarms. It's an old building. It's renovated inside. The intensive care was renewed recently, but nobody thought of having fire alarms inside. 
So by the time they discovered the fire, it was too late. And the call came to 112. It was the 16th of August, 2010. And it said there was an explosion and a fire in the maternity. The fire service sent their resources, including the medical resources. The fire service in Romania does medical response as well. And they sent the medical resources. They had a full alarm on everything we had because this maternity is a very critical area. And here you can see some of the pictures of what was done there. I will talk a little bit about that. Evacuating babies and children and mothers in labor and so on later from that hospital. The good thing is that we had the resources. By 2008, the fire department in Bucharest didn't have a medical response unit. It was one of the last in Romania to start doing this. And those resources meant the difference in this intervention, besides, of course, the ambulance service of Bucharest. Always having extra resources from this point of view is very important. And they work together with emergency departments where we have emergency physicians going out in cases like this. But of course, it was a very special situation. It was a baby intensive care unit. We needed incubators, transport incubators. We have two vehicles which do baby transport with incubators in Bucharest. How are you going to evacuate and to move babies which are 1,500 grams without an incubator? We had to improvise. We brought incubators, we brought transport incubators, but they were not sufficient. So there were a lot of challenges from this point of view. Here you can see outside. There was an organization, the police kept, these are, a lot of these people and these people here are families which heard of the fire and just came there. And they all wanted to go in. It was very hard to keep them out, in fact. And then we had the media, which we put a special place for them but I myself caught one of the media persons pushing the parents and saying, you should shout at them, you should fight them, they should let you go in, go and do it. And then they were filming. <laughs> that was what was happening. It was the first time we faced such a condition, but we could see the media pushing the families to fight the firefighters and the medical personnel so that they go into the building, which is, of course, it couldn't happen because the building was at high risk. It was full of smoke and so on. So these are some pictures which were taken by the district attorney, by the people who investigated the whole thing. And from the pictures we, and the films they have taken from the supervision uh, cameras, we saw that the staff of the hospital didn't know what to do in the first minutes. They didn't know how to behave. It was chaos, and it was people running around, but no purposeful action to evacuate those who are in other rooms where the smoke is going, or to do something, because many people were, could be evacuated just walking. It was only the intensive care and the women who were in labor, which were hard to evacuate from there. But the rest, you could evacuate the people if you were organized and if the staff in the hospital was trained to do it, but they were not. So this could, have been, could be seen. And the fire department, the nearest station was six minutes. It took them about six minutes to get to the, to the place. So the first fire engines arrived in six minutes. And this played a major role for, for, the, for the rescue of, of the of the babies. This is what they saw, the firefighters, when, the, when, the, when they arrived. You can see the smoke coming out. And it was fire. You could see the fire inside when they went into the intensive care department. And here we had children, three of them in open incubators. These are tables where you put the child. They are heated, but they, are, they don't have a cover. And there were eight children in closed incubators. Those who were in the open incubators died. Those who were in the closed incubators suffered smoke, uh, of course, burns and so on, but some of them could be rescued. 
Once we knew about this, of course, here you can see the pictures of the firefighters going up with their breathing apparatus and they went in. Now imagine firefighters are not trained to evacuate intensive care units so frequently. And what about evacuating small babies who are intubated? When you have smoke inside, you cannot see clearly and you want just to grab the child and run away. And the child is connected to a tube and so on. And so you extubate the child by mistake. You run with the child down. And somebody must take that child and rescue that child immediately. So you need teams. And inside the hospital, it's not sufficient. Because even this maternity, it had maybe one anesthesiologist on duty. It was in the afternoon, so the whole staff left home. So it was only the staff on duty. So it was only one anesthesiologist, maybe two obstetricians, one senior, one junior, or so on, and some nurses, and that's it. So the response from outside the hospital to this hospital was extremely important. And again, here, the role was played by the fact that we have the main emergency hospital, which can send doctors and nurses to support such interventions. And this is what happened here, in fact. And this is what rescued some of the babies. So you can see very fast the fire department people went in. They started taking out the children. And you can see here what we did, in fact. You can see how they were taking them. Imagine some of these children were on a lot of equipment, injection pumps, uh, uh, ventilated, and so on. And now they are carried just on something by the firefighter coming out and giving, it, giving the child to the nurse or taking the child to where we established the treatment area, because what we did is on the lower floor, we established a place where we had our doctors who came from outside, their equipment, everything, and the children were taken there. We were working on them. And then those who could, we could rescue, we were sending them outside to a burn center for children, which is another story. I will just say a few words about it. So here you can see how the children were evacuated by the nurses taking them from the firefighters and so on. These were twins, the ones you've seen there. There were twins also inside which were evacuated. And here you can see the emergency care provided inside the hospital by the medical teams which came from outside, re-intubating the children, ventilating them, and so on. When I arrived there, there were children under resuscitation children which were resuscitated and ch children which were considered dead. So what we had is initially three dead and we had to move the rest to the burn center. Now the burn center had a problem. They never had burned children which are 1,500 grams. It doesn't happen. So they don't have ventilators for these children. They don't have equipment for these children. So we had, with the Ministry of Health, to identify in other maternities free ventilators and in a way to confiscate them, to demand them, to take them, and to send them to the burn center in, into the intensive care to be able to ventilate those children. And then the next thing we had to do is to create teams of neonatologists to go and work with the burn people in their center on these children. Five children went out alive at the end. And there were the three who died inside. And then there were 11 at total, if I'm not wrong. Three died immediately. And then we took the rest to the hospital. And five survived. The finding now, the other issue which came, what do we do with the hospital? Should we leave it functioning? I had a discussion with the medical director. The manager was on vacation. And he refused to evacuate the hospital. Then I had a discussion with the fire chief. Could we leave this hospital with patients in it? There were about 200 patients in this hospital. Women under labor, as I said. Women which gave birth. Children which are not in intensive care, but which are newborns and so on. What should we do with them? We analyzed the situation. We have cut electricity. We have cut gas. We will not give back electricity because things were not clear. We will not give back the gas to the hospital. The intensive care department is destroyed. The part of the operation theater is destroyed. And the manager still wants to keep patients in that hospital. So after a discussion, 
we issued an order of evacuation and we evacuated the hospital. The idea was to find places in other maternities. It was not so hard. Maternities made places for, for us and we evacuated the patients and we used different types of vehicles. Some of them, we don't see them here. For example, we don't see the large vehicles which allow us to take patients uh, on multiple stretchers. So we put the women in, on, in labor, we put them on, in these large vehicles and we put with each two an obstetrician. There were about six of them or five of them. We put them with an obstetrician and they accompanied them to the next hospital. Luckily, we didn't have any birth in the ambulance on the way. But so this is how it looked after the fire inside. And here you can see different images on during the evacuation of the whole hospital this time with the children, with everybody which were not injured, in fact. And the, 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 the main issue that I want to come, this is the parents. We had a discussion with them. We brought them into a room. We discussed with them. We had a psychologist coming and talking to them. We explained to them what happened. We explained to them what we did. We took them away from the mass media as fast as possible because it was clear that some people wanted them to start a scandal so that they have a good, uh, what we call, uh, a good uh, exposure of that news channel or another. This is an incubator, one of the incubators. You can see how it looked inside after the fire. And that had a child in it, of course. But this is what protected them. So now, just to end, what were our conclusions. There are a lot of problems, problems of access. The entry to the hospital was blocked by a car. We had to carry it. We couldn't find the driver. We had to carry it and move it somewhere else. The personnel of the hospital was untrained. And the hospital was not equipped for such a disaster. And also the system, though we had what we needed for, for a while, we are not equipped to deal with such kinds of a disaster. And these are soft targets, which may be targets for terrorists, but they also may become a disaster without having a terrorist to come in and make it a disaster. Now, one thing that, that I would say just to end, the access to the hospitals is a problem. And one of the hospitals is where I used to work in Moorish County. I always told them, listen, no access in the back. You are blocking everything. Doctors keep on parking their cars there. What if there is a fire? First time, second time, third time. Then I was in a visit and I saw the same thing. And I used the authority I have. And I called the fire chief and I told him, now we have a drill in the hospital. Come to the hospital. We have a fire. And I told him where the fire is because I knew they won't be able to go there. So the fire engines came. They stopped. They couldn't go in. They had to draw long lines of hoses. They couldn't find the hydrants because cars were blocking them. And then we called the hospital manager and we told him, and he's a good friend of mine. I told him, you see, this is what I'm telling you. Now you are going to pay for it. And the fine is about 500 euros. And he paid it from his pocket. Whenever I go now, that hospital has a free space in that area and we can go in. They don't repeat it. They knew that it costs money if you don't do it. I'm sorry, but this was a way to impose some security issues, but this is in one hospital out of hundreds. So these hospitals need to be protected. We need to think of the vulnerabilities in them. They are very special buildings. They are full of gases, full of things, full of things that may explode, things that may cause a lot of problems. Some of them may have biosecurity labs. And imagine if a biosecurity lab, its security is breached in the middle of a city. What happens? So all these issues, we have to think of them when we are planning the security of our hospitals. I'll stop here. Happy to answer questions later. Thank you.